Welcome back for the afternoon sessions. In the morning we had sessions with a particular platform focus on live streaming uh, platforms. Now we're switching the perspective towards a brand perspective with Tamsin Selby from UBS. Welcome to KublaiConf 2020, Tamsin. Thank you, Christoph. And many thanks also for stepping in for your colleague, Jonas Karp, who was previously announced in the program and uh, unfortunately due to an injury, he can't be here. We wish you all the best, uh, Jonas, when you are, in case you are uh, watching. And uh, Tamsin, we will talk about, uh, you are um, UBS's uh, Head of Global Art Brand Activation, Sponsorship and Events. And we will talk about live streaming and how you're using it to enrich digital activation and uh, you brought us a video that we will play right now and afterwards you can say two, three words about it. So uh, what have we just seen? Um, so thanks for letting us share that video, Christoph. Um, this is actually the program that in many ways started us off on our live stream journey. Um, we've been working for four to five years with the Fondation Baila on a series of artist talks that have been live streamed um, with fantastic artists as you've, as you've seen and that's really been the start of our sort of learning journey um, in relation to this format. So. <laughs> And for those, you mentioned this 45 years uh, of history, for those who are not familiar with UBS and art and the relationship between the brand and the arts community, um, uh, why is art a topic for UBS and what are the, 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 what's the scope and um, yeah. also with regards to other sponsorships? Yeah, good idea. Um, let's take a quick step back. Um, so UBS has actually been collecting contemporary art for well over 60 years. Um, and it's a passion that we share with a lot of our clients around the world. Um, we have a very extensive uh, sponsorship platform as well, which constitutes museums and institutional museums around the world and art fairs. And um, one of the sort of foundation partners is our global lead partnership with Art Basel that we've had for over 27 years. Um, so for us, it's, it's such an important topic. Um, this has also been a drastically changed landscape in the past year. Um, because whereas our marketing and communications programs was typically structured around these 18 partnerships throughout the year, that obviously has completely changed. These are many of which are them of uh, large scale events. Um, Art Basel will typically attract 60 to 90,000 people per show. Um, so for us, we've really had to rethink our communication strategy around our sponsorship portfolio. Just as a reminder, if you're watching, please continue to uh, use the chat to send comments, to ask questions, which we will then bring into the discussion um, here. Now, uh, you mentioned this year that changed uh, a lot um, uh, before uh, the pandemic. What, uh, did your, uh, what were your activities in activation in general and maybe particularly with regards to digital activation? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, in digital, we were already very active, I would say. Um, we have a lot of dedicated channels for art at UBS. Um, within the UBS.com sites, we have a dedicated content hub, which we would update at least weekly. Um, and we have dedicated social media channels. Um, we have Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter. And um, we also populate a lot of the corporate channels in terms of content on their LinkedIn um, and across the board, really. Um, so for us, it's such an important topic that there's so much demand for with clients. Um, there was always opportunity to grow, but to date, we've often been structured in terms of our timeframes around our sponsorship portfolio and around these live events. Um, so for us, it was an opportunity to really rethink and experiment, which was fantastic. You just mentioned your clients, and actually there's a question about, um, you mentioned how uh, art is important to UBS, mm -hmm. but um, how important is art for your clients? It's hugely important. I mean. Uh, particularly for our wealth management business, as you can imagine, a huge number of our clients um, are either starting out in collecting or are very, very established collectors. Um, so for us, it's a passion we share. I think it's clear from our collection that we are um, at the top of our game in terms of collecting ourselves and have been for, for some time. 
Um, but um, it's a fantastic opportunity for dialogue with our clients and we're really passionate about seeing what we can do to help the market and the art world around that topic. And does it change with younger clients and younger target groups or is um, art, uh, does art continue to be very relevant? Well, we've actually seen in, in the past few years a huge growth in millennial collectors uh -huh. um, across the board. Um, and this is something that our art market research has showed that um, younger generation collectors um, are actually popping up the market at the moment. They are the most active, they're the most confident online. And this has been a huge change in the art world that we've seen that in this period, you know, uh, industry that was so focused on live events and live visual experiences has had to completely change itself. Um, and the digital acceleration in the past year has been quite incredible. I think we've seen the things like um, you know the auction houses have done these hybrid yeah. virtual auctions. We've seen art fairs like Art Basel go online with these online viewing rooms, which are really high spec. And we've seen all of the galleries also participate in this. And it's been such an important way of propping up the industry during this time. Um, I mean, let's be real: galleries, private galleries themselves, have downsized by about a third, often during mm. this period so right. it's been really necessary to find yeah. new ways of working during this period <clears throat> but we find collectors are much more confident online in the past year and artists see it now as a really important part of their practice to be engaging in these platforms to be doing instagram lives to be out yeah. there and really the wealth of programming out there has been absolutely fantastic in terms of the generosity of organizations to offer that to the public so it's been really great yeah so interesting to hear about the younger uh, audience because mm -hmm. in in a previous session this morning we saw how young Twitch is so maybe Twitch yeah. will be <laughs> an important live streaming platform for the art world mm -hmm. um, you just outlined what happened in the art world due to the pandemic um, did um, did um, uh, galleries and uh, artists and uh, uh, brands which are active in this sphere see more risks or more opportunities or what uh, what did you observe um, I think they certainly saw a huge amount of opportunities online. Um, I think the risk ultimately was the issue around interacting with their customers and this gives them an opportunity to broaden their market and have a more globalised conversation, um, which is really important for the health of the market in, in the future. Um, but you know, we've seen galleries like House & Birth and David Sverner doing very sophisticated things in terms of online viewing rooms. Um, interaction with clients, um, interpretation, storytelling around artists' videos and experiences. Um, Art Basel have made huge steps on their online viewing rooms in the past year. It was a project that was very much in the works for a number of years and now it's really evolved in terms of frequency and in terms of the quality of content on there to these amazing curated presentations that they provide and really exciting programs around them. So. Yep. And actually, the video which we saw initially announces an event mm -hmm. uh, next week. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we had already had some experience, as I mentioned, doing live streaming. We'd worked um, with the Fondation Baile. We'd done it during the Annie Leibovitz tour we did a number of years ago. Um, but we've really stepped that up in the past um, few months. Uh, we now do one at least monthly. Next week, we have two. Um, we have a fabulous talk with the Turner Prize winning artist Susan Phillips, who's an amazing sound artist, happening on Thursday at the Fondation Baila. And then on Friday, we have a talk with Art Basel, Mark Spiegler, um, Clem McAndrew, who's an amazing cultural economist who does a lot of our research with us, um, to talk about the art market and the situation in APAC. And so the live stream is open to the public on Thursday? It is open to the public, yes. Um, I think uh, there are slides later where I've got a bit of information on that as well. Um, <clears throat> so this will be live on our Facebook uh, channel and um, also on this page that we've developed called UBS Art Live. And okay. I can talk a little bit about why we did that as well. <laughs> Sorry for bringing your slides. I'm out of order. No, not I, at all. Um, <laughs> just thought that uh, I think that's one of the questions maybe that yeah. our audience asks themselves. Another question was um, you mentioned. Uh, uh, you described the interaction and the question is what type of interaction does take place? Uh, can viewers ask questions? Mm -hmm. Do artists show how they're painting? What happens? Mm -hmm. um, so we've tried a number of different formats and we're still experimenting. Um, I, we've done a lot in terms of art market research and that's been a big drive in terms of content because there hasn't been a great deal for the industry and that's been so important during this period. 
Um, and so there's always a question about how to make that more dynamic and visual. Um, and we work with a wonderful company called Proudfoot, um, who essentially have worked really hard on developing their vision mixing. Um, and they do some incredible things now about integrating B-roll, the graphs, all sorts of combinations of visual assets into, um, into the presentations that we do. Um, it's, it's a good challenge because I think things have changed a lot in, in the past few months. I think originally the talking head scenario worked really well mm -hmm. and people really want to be part of the community and have an op opportunity to interact and discuss. And now I think there's a slight element of fatigue around that, that unless there's new data or new insights, it's really hard to get cut through on that sort of thing. So we've shifted our focus to working a little bit more alongside that, again with artists, um, and trying to develop a bit of a hybrid model. Um, so we are planning, for example, a studio visit with an artist called Shanique Smith, who's based in LA in cool. November. Um, I think it's quite a big ask for an artist to arrange that sort of thing because yeah. they want to show their work, but they might not be technically proficient. And to do a studio visit yeah. live is challenging. So what we've decided to do is a combination of, we'll do two filming sessions. We'll do a lot of pre-recorded, really high quality footage of the works, mm -hmm. of her practice, of her painting. Um, and then we'll integrate that into the conversation as she's discussing the works. It also affords the opportunity to show works in other places as well. So she has an amazing piece at the moment that speaks to race and inequality that's being shown at the Baltimore Museum that was closed. Mm -hmm. And so it's great for us to be able to show that on camera as well. So. And uh, there's a question about uh, platforms and channels. You mentioned, mm -hmm. mentioned Instagram Live. What other channels are you using to live stream? So on the whole, we use Instagram TV in terms of cut downs. Yes. Um, but I suppose when we're thinking about channels to do it on, we sort of categorize them into two segments um, with our different objectives. So one objective is obviously to raise brand awareness around what we're doing yeah. around art and our partnerships and our passion in that field. And for that, Facebook and LinkedIn are really great. Um, and LinkedIn particularly, we see incredibly high quality in engagement and comments in relation yeah. to the talks that we put on. Um, but I think we all know that it's very difficult on social media to uh, keep the audience captive for a long period of time. Yeah. So a Facebook Live might attract something like 200,000 viewers, but there'll also be a large portion of those sort of looking through yeah. their feed. Um, and whilst it's, that's valuable for them to see the brand association, see the content we're putting on, you know, there may only be a handful or a few hundred that actually then look at it for you know, half an hour or something yeah. like that. So for us, it was really important then also to develop our own platform during this period. Um, so we worked on developing um, a platform that sits on our website, it's called UBS Art Live. Um, and um, the rationale behind this was we wanted to create a platform that encouraged higher engagement. Um, I think you'll see the results here have actually been really good. Um, so we have an average watch, watch time on that platform now of just under 40 minutes. Um, and the reason for this is, for us, you know, there's the importance of broadcasting it to the public, but also to targeted audiences, whether it's, you know, particularly a group in APAC that we want to talk to, or somewhere else in the world, um, or a particular demographic. And it means that we can issue invitations to this platform, and they can have a really clean, focused experience. Um, sorry, I should have put on this slide, there's also a Q&A function <laughs> as part of that, um, which is also um, really great and something that's moderated then by our team as well. So it provides all the essential information about the podcast, about the webcast, um, and then, you know, there's a clean um, um, sort of visuals here. You can either focus on one speaker or four speakers, um, and then in terms of the playback, then we also get this subtitled as well. So. Yeah. But at the same time, it's very authentic. So they're really sitting in their living room, yeah. and you would, you couldn't uh, uh, meet them like this um, in, yeah. uh, on, on any other platform. It has a wonderful sense of intimacy as well. I think people have felt closer almost to some of these. It feels more human in some ways. So it's it's definitely had its advantages as well. For us, I think um, you know another huge advantage of live streaming has been um, this idea that we can put together talks with people around the world. I mean, you've done an amazing job of putting get, together this program today with speakers from all over the world. Thank you. Um, and we can do this as well. We can get people in conversation who might have been difficult to get to speak to each other in the same place. Um, and we don't have to worry about the carbon footprint, which is fantastic. Exactly. 
Um, but the other thing, because we've experimented in quite a few different formats during this period that's worked really well, um, is just this sense of different phasing of the communication. So with a webcast, you get this amazing immediacy of content, and that's really helped to create a sense of dialogue and community still. Um, and you know, within a, a sort of period that's been very strange for all of us, it sort of punctuated it with a sense of an event as well, which has been really important to kind of bring back some structure as well to things. Um, it obviously has had wider reach, it's very global audiences. So for us, it's been great because we might have sponsorships in these different markets around the world, but we'll have a chance to target them once. Whereas now we can go back to our audiences in Taipei or Israel with content year round that's relevant to them as well. Absolutely. I just, um, there's a few other <laughs> notes there in terms of benefits. I mean, for us, obviously, you know, it's cost effective in terms of production. Um, and it's really fantastic in terms of bringing traffic into the EBS.com sites. And we've seen a huge benefit, obviously, from our uh, content hub throughout the year now from that as well. Yeah, actually about such benefits, that will be the topic of the next session with mm -hmm. uh, Christian Eichhorn. He will talk about content strategies and all these benefits from having live streams as content machines, sort of, in yeah. the middle. Um, there's one more question about uh, not only um, platforms, but also new developments in technology. Um, is a virtual reality, augmented reality, already a topic that um, you're looking into? It is, yes. We've done a little bit in terms of um, with VR on Facebook previously um, with some fantastic um, experiences around the Venice Biennale several years ago. Um, and it's something we're looking to bring into the live stream experience. Um, there are obviously challenges, and I think for us a prerequisite is that you don't need to necessarily have equipment. Um, and so there'll be different phasings. There will be potentially an, a content offer for people who actually have the, <laughs> the headgear. Yes. Um, and then people who don't, who can, exactly, who can also experience um, this, um, this content as well. Um, it's something we're actually looking into with our partners, partly because artists during this period have been incredibly creative at creating exactly. um, what, you know, these worlds uh, that they can live in. And you know, for us, it's a very exciting area. Um, the, of development that you begin to see these teams um, of producers who are working often with video game technology developing these incredible worlds and you realize that you know art to date has been so focused around developing something for a room or a wall there's so much possibility in terms of experiencing it online yeah. but still just we're scratching the surface of and to be able to integrate that into our live streaming is definitely a goal down the line so it's something we're going to be piloting in December, January with a couple of artists. So. Very interesting. Yeah. Actually, also something that we already discussed in, uh, in previous sessions, that it's, mm -hmm. it's here, but it's new, so still a lot of experimentation needed. Yeah. Um, so far, we were talking about uh, art, because, of course, that's your main um, um, focus and your responsibility. Mm -hmm. One question from Bernard is about uh, other sponsoring topics. And mm -hmm. what you're outlining here, is it also something that UBS uses? in other areas? Absolutely, we have this incredible program uh, called Nobel Live. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with our Nobel Laureates program, but yep. obviously leading uh, economists, economists from yep. around the world. Um, and this program was obviously a live program that was done in markets around the world and, and now is offered online to our clients. Um, there's that aspect. We've also been working obviously hard with other partners such as Mercedes and Formula One in creating sort of virtual ga um, games and experiences also that we can um, enjoy and, and bring an opportunity also for other partners like the Montreux Jazz Festival to have an opportunity to speak and get more exposure during this time as well. Now just regarding this slide here, there's another question from Alain um, and he would like to know whether the cost for live streaming is bigger or smaller than for offline events. Can you make such a comparison? I think in terms of the scale of reach and cost per interaction, it's obviously far, 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 far lower. Um, I think these things can be done at a, at a reasonable cost um, for sure. I would say if you have a budget, it's definitely worth investing in production. Um, we treat them like normal client events in that we really walk through the process in terms of the client and the user experience and make sure that it's as easy and facilitated as possible. Um, and um, for us, you know, to have additional production elements like vision mixing, um, to be able to work with you know, great studios like this, uh, mm -hmm. where there are opportunities is, is well worth it because, as I said, there's so much offer out there 
you know, to have a sort of higher production element provides real cut through. Yes, so because regarding production, there is also a question about the process, how, what, what is needed to make such a production happen? Yeah. Um, I mean, it really depends on the scale of, of your planning and, and what you're putting together. Um, obviously, if you have a very high tech uh, uh, you know, individual who has some expertise in the area, you can, you know, we, we can organize with certain artists that we work with for them to do immediate, um, you know, Instagram uh, filming and, and, uh, and lives uh, from their studios. But as I mentioned, the quality is always then a little touch and go. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, we would always appoint some kind of production team and lead. Um, other partners we work with, they're obviously our sponsorship partners, um, often, you know, a, a sort of, some sort of third party distributor, because that's what our sponsorships also provide us. Yeah. You know, we've worked a lot with our bars in this period about how we can distribute and maximize and amplify this to all of our audiences as well. Um, there's the element of promotion as well, so you may, you may want to work with a social media company, with a PR company around it, because actually this is creating amazing owned media at the moment, and yep. that's um, really worth a small investment to amplify that. Um, for us, the most important thing is briefing the speakers and making sure that they're comfortable, and so we always do a, a briefing sit down where we walk through what the experience is going to be like for them with a production company. Um, there's a lot of discussion online about the backdrops to rooms and stuff, and we really want to provide as so much support as possible. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen uh, the Rachel Your Room on Twitter, but <laughs> that's a very entertaining okay. handle. But it shows that you know there's quite a lot of scrutiny on those various aspects as well. So it's <laughs> about supporting it our, our speakers. And then thinking about what other elements you might want to bring into it, what visuals you can provide. Is there video content? Is there sound? Um, what you would like to overlay with the discussion and the individual who is contributing to the discussion. So um, then, of course, there is afterwards the post-production, um, yes. which is really important. We try and get a replay up either immediately or as soon as possible, ideally subtitled. Um, then it provides fantastic content for social media, so a lot of cut downs that we can use across our channels um, when we've got the right sound bites in relation to that. And that replay content is almost we see as phase two, where this content plays out again and again, and um, we, you know, again utilize that in the markets that we have sponsorships in across the world as well, where the content's relevant to that. So, what are the channels that you're using um, with regards to social media? Um, so social media, um, UBS Art are most active. Um, so we have these dedicated channels um, on um, Facebook, um, on Instagram and Twitter. Um, that said, we see the content across all of UBS's channels. So in addition to this, you know, obviously UBS have LinkedIn, WeChat, yeah. um, and, um, and, and many YouTube, more. YouTube, I assume. YouTube, we have actually, uh, um, across our sponsorship platforms, we have Passions YouTube page, which is part yeah. of the UBS YouTube's yeah. page as well. So that's a really important point also in terms of phasing, is then to think about where you want to archive the content and whether you want to create a content series and how you brand that content series and whether there's yeah. graphics that you want to overlay on it to create that branding and then where that lives afterwards in a way that you know someone can really enjoy scrolling through a library if they have the time so i mentioned twitch um uh, before which is a uh, big um in the live streaming world mm -hmm. are you already evaluating the platform what are your views for us, it's early days for anything like Twitch, so it's, uh, it's something that we all will definitely be evaluating because we're always interested in what's upcoming and out there, um, but um, not, not, not quite as yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, of course, I believe you're not only observing what you're doing, but also what maybe competitors, other banks are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, Bernhard would like to know what are you observing? Are you benchmarking yourself to other players? Mm -hmm. Um, well, because we focus on the topic of art, we do two things. We benchmark, obviously, with the other um, corporates that have large art collections and large yeah. art activations. Um, and we also benchmark a little bit against being an art brand ourselves. So against, you know, the, uh, the, ga the private galleries, against mm. the museums and what they're doing, which is most interesting. Um, there's obviously been a huge trend at the moment in terms of putting art exhibitions online um, with online viewing rooms and that's something we're looking to do more and more with our collection is to provide thematic exhibitions online around particular topics um, to really have opportunity while 
our galleries are currently closed to share our collection with the broader public as well. Um, yes, I'm just checking some other questions. Uh, if I would like to know whether the art world, you just outlined what's happening here, um, is the art world ready um, to only be to only happen online um, in times of the pandemic? Um, what what's your experience, your observations? Um, I think it's been like many industries a really challenging time for the art world, um, and as I mentioned, you know the research that we've done has shown that private galleries alone sales have gone down by a third um, and galleries as a result have had to downsize. Um, for museums it's been really critical in terms of funding models and this is a very difficult time for museums and institutions and for artists they haven't had the opportunity to show their work. So in a sense it's been an, a definite acceleration and a forced acceleration you could say. Um, but I think now the momentum has picked up. I think these organ these players, there's more confidence online. They're seeing that people are not in consuming art online from an entertainment perspective, but actually the growth of sales online of artworks has gone up by about 30% in the last yeah. year. It's inevitable because that's where the art is being exchanged and, and, and presented at the moment. Um, and I think we have the audiences online now, we have more confidence. Um, and we have artists who are willing to be more engaged in it. And a lot of organizations and brands have now put quite a lot of investment in this. Yeah. And they've upskilled and they've looked and they're looking for talent in relation to this. And so I don't think it's an area that's going to go back. Um, I think, you know, it's obviously been a very difficult time for the arts, but there have been really positive headlines. So um, Sotheby's, for example, did. Um, an online sale in June where they managed to, it was a virtual sale. We um, see the two meters exactly. distance on the picture. <laughs> Social, they have a socially distance, but you can also see the live streaming set up a little bit there. Um, and um, you know, that sale brought in 363 million, um, which at this time is just incredibly important for the you know health of that company, but also signals not only that there's a confidence in buying online that's increasing, there's confidence in buying at quite high price points as well, yeah. uh, which is a huge change. Um, and galleries are doing a lot to do things like cater to those audiences by creating video experiences where you can go up close, you can ask to you know, zoom in on the signature, zoom yeah. in on aspects, you get the very high tech scanning of these things. And the technology is hugely developing to allow this. Will we ever only just want to experience art online? I don't think so, because I, it's such an area where it provides such a way to interact with other people. It's ultimately a social thing. Um, you want to discuss art, you want to have conversations about it, and this is what our clients want. They want the exploration, they want the discovery, and they're missing the fairs. They really are. Yeah. All our research shows this. Um, and, um, you know, I think towards the end of next year, the middle of next year, they're going to want to ideally, if the situation allows, yeah, to be back buying, whether the experiences will change a little. I think you know, there's a lot to be seen. Perhaps there'll be smaller, more boutique experiences, but um, change is here and I think it's exciting. And um, this will only augment the experiences that we have and in many ways make it more democratic. Because one really interesting development out of this is there's been more price transparency in the market. So a big shift in online has also been the, uh, at least a price range would be posted online on these. And that's also been great for younger collectors because they can actually see now that there are works that they can afford and you don't have to approach a gallerist to ask for how much a work costs. You can begin to identify this yourself and begin to develop a knowledge of artwork that's in your price range that excites you. Yeah. So that's also been a really great development. Speaking of prices and new technology, there is a question whether um, uh, you or in general have you seen galleries accepting crypto as payment in the art world? Um, we're, not, we're not close enough really to, to galleries to, to know that. Um, and I think maybe that will be down the line. I think the thing about blockchain that's more exciting to do with galleries is the development of price transparency. Yeah. That perhaps a big issue in the art world is provenance and authentication. Um, and so there's been a lot of work being done behind the scenes by auction houses and fairs in potential projects that could 
uh, help the situation and create a more structured way to track the development yeah. and, the, and the interchange of art. Yeah, um, exactly. So yeah, whether those two things may eventually come hand in hand, I don't know. <laughs> live streaming actually will be uh, at the blockchain and live streaming will be a topic um, in another session mm -hmm. later this afternoon. And then in a previous session, um, we discussed about uh, businesses growing out of the pandemic with mm -hmm. live streaming. Did you observe artists sort of became becoming famous during the pandemic because they used live streaming or new technologies? I think we've still got a little way to come on that. I think what's really interesting is some of the artists that are producing some of the most high tech aspects work in teams. So there isn't really this sense of the artist or this kind of, you know, this sense of ownership necessarily in, in the same way with these particular artworks that's developing. I think some artists are making their names absolutely with these things. I mean, one of the big internet uh, Instagram sensations during the lockdown was the Two Wizards account, <laughs> which everyone was following and interested in. And I think what's really exciting is we start to see very established artists also working with live streaming, with uh, VR, with AR. People like Acute Art are doing really interesting work in this regard in terms of also democratizing access to the work of artists like this. Um, and it, it, it remains to be seen, I think. <laughs> yes, it remains to be seen. Looking into the future, there's uh, Eva, um, and uh, she apparently knows very well that there will be a new art market report released next year. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, that's okay. right. <laughs> um, and she's asking whether it's, it will be one of the most exciting releases ever. Well, I mean, our art market reports, we like to think are always the most exciting releases <laughs> ever. Um, we, I, do, I don't know if Eva's aware, but we also just released one in September, which was a really interesting uh, short-term view of what's happening in the market at the moment. So that's on ubs.com slash art. Okay. Then in March, there'll be an update on that that we're working that with, with uh, Claire McAndrew. Um, one of the things we're working at at the moment is collector's surveys in all the markets, um, oh. because that's forms a very important component of the report research. Um, and I think, you know, as I said, it's a very difficult period in the art world, but there are glimmers of hope in terms of evolution of digital and in terms of the change of collecting practices that also we're looking to explore a bit more about and learn a little bit more about during this period. And do you already have plans for 2021 for next year with regards to live streaming? And other we have a lot of plans. I think um, you can continue expect to expect that to be a monthly thing. Yeah. I think also the interesting thing is when I say it's that these things will will very much still be here <laughs> next year. Is um, I think audience is now expected. Um, so Art Basel, as I said, have done a fantastic job at adapting and producing. You know, which in the, these will continue in the future online viewing rooms, which can accompany the fair experience. And originally, this was planned this year to augment the fair experience. Um, but instead, of, obviously, this, is, this has been a platform that's, that's grown hugely at this Just time. So that we understand what we're seeing here mm. um, in Dialogo, that's the art piece. So this is uh, um, Art Basel in Basel, yes. um, which typically would attract sort of 60 to 90,000 um, visitors. And was yeah, and um, Art Basel have obviously been in a difficult position position that none of the fairs will happen this year no. but they've done an amazing laudable job at bringing all of that online and supporting their galleries with really amazing both editorial um, promotion um, and keeping people in touch with what's happening with the galleries but also with sales online um, so the next um, series of the online viewing rooms happens next week um, again as well um, so this um, opens to the public um, from the 28th onwards and um, you were able to view this one, this particular one is a curated presentation on 20th century art, so everything from 1900 to 1999. Um, then about a month ago, they did one dedicated to art just from this year, which was extremely interesting, as you can imagine. Um, and then in December, around the time that Miami Beach would have occurred, Art Basel and Miami Beach, they'll also do a presentation of galleries that would have shown um, during that time, and inevitably, obviously, a focus on US and Latin American art amongst others so in a way this art basel website becomes a live streaming platform well what's interesting is um so we've worked with art basel on, on quite a lot of live streams during this period um, um we've worked with um three live streams around our research reports that we've done with 
directors of Art Basel and um, the cultural economist Claire McAndrew. Um, and they've also participated in other partner discussions, such as this one I have here, with, which was uh, really run with our partner in Russia, the, the Garage Museum, which is a fantastic contemporary art museum there in Moscow. Um, and um, I think what's been great out of this is working with our partners how to promote these things. So um, in addition to the sales platform, our Basel have produced a really amazing um, events program as well. Um, so, just trying to click this. <laughs> here we go. Um, here we go. Um, so um, you'll see that when we've worked on these events with Art Basel, they've embedded them into their online viewing room experiences. So they create both the VIP events program and a general public events program. Um, so you know, the first two days of these online viewing rooms are dedicated to VIP access, and then subsequently the opens to the public. Um, so we worked with them on an online viewing uh, event, basically with our um, museum partner in Russia, the Garage um, Artsy, who you know is also a, a massive player yeah. in the art world, and our Basel, and again talking about the responsibilities around collecting in a changing world. And so this is then embedded also as a link into their site. They're promoting this on YouTube, Facebook as well. They're sending out um, promotional materials as you what can see on What is trickbox.life? So trickbox is actually part of the back end of this platform that we yeah. built. Okay. Um, so that's the EBS Art Live page um, okay. that we do dedicated for each of these, uh, these broadcasts as well. Um, so for us, it's been a great moment for amplification with our partners. And there's also been a really great cross dialogue as well, because you know we work with a number of fairs and museums, and they're also really interested in interchanging each other's content and, and collaborating. So for example, here we have two of our partners speaking on the same panel and also pushing that out to their audiences as well. So Sounds very exciting and full of opportunities. Are there also challenges and things that don't really work out yet? I think there are definitely challenges. I think we've touched on some of them. I think the production aspect is there, there are certain pitfalls around that. And that's why I'd say, you know, if there is budget, I would, um, even on a small scale, apply it to, you know, to suppliers and vendors who have some expertise in this area, because it also takes the pressure off the speakers, which I think is really important to all the contributors, um, the talent that you're bringing in. Um, I think the other thing is this shift towards integrating more elements and it's something that we're experimenting with at the moment is there's so much material out there at the moment it's difficult to know how to differentiate from the crowd and for that I think you know we all have to take a bit of a step up in terms of the quality of visuals mm -hmm. particularly for us when we work in the art world is providing better b-roll integrating this in the conversations in a seamless way so it's almost produced a bit like a tv production yeah um, with regards to production and your own art collection, um, uh, there's one more question again from Eva, um, who is a brief, um, she knows very well what you're doing, and she would like to know whether the UBS art collection um, already uh, has a digital, a digital way to show what's in, in the collection. We do. We have, um, so we have a content hub on ubs.com slash art. Um, and within that, we have different components of offer. So we have all our brand journalism and our news in one segment. Um, and um, then obviously at the core of this is our collection page, which we've just updated. So do go and have a take a look at ubs.com slash art collection. Um, there's a new video up there, which we produced this year, which really gives a gorgeous overview of the collection, um, particularly with an emphasis on our Swiss holdings. and. That will then develop in, in future months where we'll show, showcase a little bit about more what we have in APAC and more what we have in the US in terms of the focus. So it is a really important time for us when obviously our gallery is still closed, um, which is usually based in Manhattan, to find different ways to showcase our collection to the public. And as part of that, we are producing more articles online. We've started a social media campaign called The Joy of Looking, which introduces works from the collection on a weekly basis. Um, and we are looking for more interesting ways to, pr to present the collection, not only the core of what we consider collection highlights, but also thematic exhibitions. Um, so one of the very important founders of our collection was an individual called Don Moron. Um, and as part of 
um, some of his legacy communications and, um, and shows that will happen next year um, as a collector. We um, have presented, or we will be in, in a position to present a thematic show around you know, what he brought to the UBS art collection and okay. you know, in terms of his best practice, in terms of collecting and how that's really un, sort of underpinned all the values that we have in terms of collecting today. So, yeah, we'll uh, be communicating that on our channels. So, um, yes, so we've seen this <laughs> channel where yeah. we can follow. Um, we already talked about the plans for next year. Um, Simona would like to know, in five years, um, do, you have a, do you have a strategy, a long-term strategy, um, looking at the current situation? Um, and maybe what she means the, the trend and nobody mm -hmm. knows whether we will return to what we mm -hmm. used to uh, uh, call normal <laughs> yeah um, how are you dealing with this situation mm -hmm. I mean for us we continue to explore and enjoy exploring with our partners new ways of working um, so there you know there are certain long-term relationships that we have with our Basel with our museum network um, and with the artists and at the core of all of this is also our collection um, so these are components that are not going to change um, but I think what will change as we venture into these new formats whether it's live stream virtual reality um, and really try and look at different ways online to share our collection globally with the public around the world and that's really exciting to have the opportunity to do that but also to start a global dialogue as well on the website so <laughs> and then another viewer would like to know whether you can recommend an artist to follow on instagram a very cool instagram artist um that's a very good question this is such a wealth of artists uh, to follow at the moment I or mean, just follow you yeah. yes well you can yes you can follow on our, instagram. Uh, you can follow us on instagram and you can see our pics of artists here we that, go again that we promote across the board as well, yeah. <laughs> um, I would also point you to our Basel social media channels, which are really exceptional as well. All right, and then uh, there's one more question about how do you combine now these live streams? You mentioned uh, a lot of uh, brand journalism you're doing mm -hmm. and articles that you're writing. Is that sort of your content strategy, content machine around live streams or are there other pieces? Um, so we actually experimented with quite a few things during this period um, and it was quite varied. Um, so not only did we work with our partners on developing new ways for them to present themselves digitally, um, but we were also quite <laughs> experimental in terms of our approaches and it ranged from everything. So, um, you know, with the Fondation Weiler in Switzerland, we worked on a series of videos around guided meditations to works of art from the collection. Um, which was incredibly popular because also this has been a time of stress and we wanted to encourage some self-care. Um, so here we have an example of a gorgeous meditation um, that you can also use on our site uh, to a Rothko painting. Uh, so that was one aspect that was a different sort of multidisciplinary <laughs> project um, that was very popular. Um, we've also started experimenting a lot more with podcasts and with different providers of podcasts as well and different ways to distribute them. So. Monocle was someone we've had a long-term relationship with, but um, we've moved now to doing a more regular art podcast with them, which sits on the bulletin with UBS. And this one we talked a lot about. Um, if you want an overview of tech and digital disruption, there's some fantastic speakers there and experts that can contribute on, on that front if, if you want to look at that as well. This is also on the UBS.com site. Um, we, we basically provided a guide for our clients on how to enjoy art online. We did focus sort of different interpretations of formats and experiencing our collection. Um, so we tried a lot of very varied things. I think we learned a lot in terms of what works for a broad public and what really works in terms of high engagement with a much more focused target group. And how is the collaboration with these partners? Is it because everything is so new, is it very agile, a lot of experimentation or? Yeah, I mean, I have to say um, chapeau to a lot of our partners uh, during this period, like the Fondation Weiler, like Art Basel, like Taipei Dangdai, I mean, there are too many to mention, um, that have really incredibly been very, very flexible at developing new formats during this period. 
uh, Fondation have come up with some uh, really fantastic things, so do check out their website as well and their YouTube online. Um, not only developing presentations of their own collection, but also um, externally in terms of developing projects and programmes with artists, but also very multidisciplinary projects as well. Um, as I mentioned, Art Basel are very active. I mean, in the last three years, their social media and editorial programmes have exploded. They've also done an amazing job at developing that and um, strands of content on a regular basis, which are very well branded. Um, they've developed their sort of social media and their communities to around 3 million uh, followers. So, you know, for an art platform, which is usually much more niche and, 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 and you know, very strong, dedicated, engaged following, but that, you know, that is a, a high, an excellent high yeah. number. So, yeah. <laughs> so maybe we can summarize. Um, initially, I mentioned the brand perspective on live streaming and it really go, goes beyond sponsorship and having the UBS logo somewhere on, uh, on Art Basel communication. Mm -hmm. You are like a media company um, uh, producing a lot of content and live streaming now uh, provides a lot of opportunities. Yeah. I mean, what's been great just during this period, our client demand for art has not gone down, it's gone up. Um, and this continues to be such an important platform to talk to our audiences about because it's something that we're genuinely really passionate about. Um, and to share that with our audiences is exciting. Um, and so for us, it's never, our sponsorships have never been about putting our logo on something. It's always been a co-production. It's always been a collaboration. We talk about them as partners. Um, and we've developed, co-produced lots of projects together, whether it's Art Basel and our art market research or the Artist Talk series that we developed with Fondas and Baile. Um, and this is just taking it a step further in terms of experimentation and agility. And, you know, it's been a really exciting time to change with our partners to see what's possible and what's out there. Um, and I think we're just at the start of that journey and um, it'll be exciting to see where it goes next year. Certainly very interesting already now and we're looking forward to seeing uh, what's coming. Many thanks for these great insights, Tamsin. Thank you for having me. And uh, for your time. Uh, that's it for uh, this session and uh, after a short break with some uh, behind the scenes camera and music, um, we will be back with our next speaker.